Hi. It's great to see you. <laughs> it's lovely to see you. I'm just trying to see what we've got in the picture. Look at your bookshelves. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite tall, yeah. <laughs> the that smile. is amazing. We've just been trying to work out how we could fit more shelving in the space. It's a constant challenge to do that. Yeah, yeah we uh, we moved here a few years ago and I, I insisted to, that there needed to be a wall where I could have all of my books. <laughs> yeah, I can see. It looks great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so first off, I have to congratulate you on your Booker Prize nomination. Amazing. How does, how does it feel? Oh, it's so, well, I mean, it's quite overwhelming. Um, I obviously wasn't expecting it. And um, one of the things I was just thinking about today, actually, because I've been talking to so many pe more people, is how I've realized how much I've missed being able to talk about my book but everybody's books because of what we've been going through I mean obviously you're more connected um to book people and book world probably than I am but as a debut novelist I was really looking forward to talking to people about yeah. books yeah and, uh, and that now I feel a little bit more connected because people have been in touch and you know it's just it's great it's amazing and what I, I love the list I think it's really exciting yeah, it's a really fascinating group of books. Different approach this year. I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask, but like, when did you find out you were on the list? Was it when it was actually announced or did the um, publisher or agent get in touch with you beforehand? Or You, you get to get a little bit of a heads up, but you're mm -hmm. not allowed to tell anyone. Yeah, of course. So I think the last time we saw each other was back in the beginning of February at the book launch party for your novel, uh, which feels like a lifetime ago now. <laughs> and, uh, and if viewers aren't aware, um, in addition to writing, you are also a professional actor. So I, I'm almost like hesitant to ask, but what have the past few months been like for you? Um, did you have many projects that were planned and are now delayed and cancelled and all of that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, um, my other job is quite sort of seat of your pants anyway. Um, you know, sometimes you don't know till the last minute, but there were some things that, yes, uh, sadly have been cancelled as show and and a bit and some filming. Um, and also just, it, it's not even just that, it's the, the future, which is quite alarming, because I don't think there's mm. going to be hardly any theatre this year. Mm. And then... I don't know, people are talking about the summer of next year, maybe, I guess, depending on how things go. Um, and obviously people need to be safe. Uh, so I do understand um, that it's difficult to make any plans at the moment when things are changing on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, that is really heartbreaking. I mean, not mm. for, for me so so much, I miss that job, but um, for all the people who, who work, in the theatre, um, and you know, who's who's who? A lot of people actually have proper steady jobs in the theatre, who mm -hmm. aren't the ones gallivanting around on stage, and and their lives have just been totally turned upside down. Actors are more used to not knowing what they're doing next. Mm -hmm. To some extent, we, we get used to this uh, those these different periods of time when you might not be working. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's the long term, and what's going to happen to our lovely theatres? But the story storytelling aspect um, and, the, and the arts themselves I know eventually they're very resilient and people will find ways around it and will 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 solve problems and in the long term I feel quite confident but in the next year I think it's going to be really difficult. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, on to cheerier subjects um, this this is your debut uh, novel so um, when, have you always written prose or did you start relatively recently because I think when we first met in 2015 you were studying creative writing at that time? I always wrote um, and I was one of those kids who was always trying to put on plays and writing plays and bossing everybody around and uh, if I didn't have a script then I'd write one um, <laughs> but I did pinch a lot obviously um, and then as an actor you're, you're very much part of a collaborative process and you're very much involved in that and there's there didn't used to be so much devising i think there's more devising that happens now where it's more of a collaborative um process the actual creating of the play which i would have loved to have uh, to have done years ago but um I sort of stopped writing for a while and then I went back to school because I left school and, and started work when I was quite young. Um, I went back to school through the OU in my 30s 
and um, then I did it. So I did a, a undergraduate degree and then an MA in creative writing. And then I went to Goldsmiths and did my PhD because I had the idea that I wanted to do this book. And that's a great university. I mean, they produce so many writers of like really innovative fiction um, and so uh yeah obviously like a sympathetic place for um this style of that very creative novel i guess yes yeah absolutely um i mean even so there were there was a, a few furrowed brows i think when i first said this was what <laughs> i wanted to do um and i was lucky that blake morrison was my supervisor um but uh it was you know i had this very strong idea of what i wanted it to be and um it, it was hard at the time to quite communicate what that was and how that would look. And what, what drew you to writing a novel rather than like a, a play or a film script since mm -hmm. your background is more in the, I mean, obviously you've always read novels, but, um, but yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I'm slightly obsessed with novels. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think I really wanted the autonomy of writing a novel um, obviously you can write, you can write scripts and plays, um, but they are best served when made and produced. Um, mm -hmm. and I, having spent my whole life, uh, waiting to be asked to do my job, um, the idea of just being able to, to write something, uh, that even if only one other person read it, that was, that had achieved its own goals in a way, um, that that really appeals to me because I I, I love telling stories, but I, I have to usually be part of so many other people's. Even when you finished a mm -hmm. film, they your your performance is then in the hands of the director and the editor and everybody uh, who's looking at it and chopping it up into little little bits and pieces. So I just mm -hmm. it's I suppose it's a slight control issue. <laughs> <laughs> For once, got to control the whole thing. <laughs> It's totally fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you actually begin writing this? Was it at Goldsmiths? And, um, yeah. and, and then what was your initial inspiration for it since you had the idea before you started? Um, yeah, well, I'd done um, philosophy and literature as my undergraduate degree. And mm -hmm. um, I'd always been fascinated by these thought experiments um, and how across all loads of different disciplines but science in particular i thought was so intriguing that they use these very um literary devices to explain concepts mm. uh, or, or to explore them even and and it's actually part of the conversation between philosophers in in, in uh, studies of uh, consciousness um where one philosopher will have a thought experiment and then there'll be a response sometimes that's another thought experiment that's in response to the first one um and i and that really intrigued me because i love the idea that these aren't two separate worlds science and and the arts actually they're all one thing very much as as, as we are all one thing and I, I liked the idea of exploring um, the, the mind and maybe the soul um, through these thought experiments. And did you first conceive of it as a novel or did it start as separate sort of short stories? And also, do you object to it being called a novel of interconnected short stories or do you prefer no. it to be called <laughs> just a novel? <laughs> no, that, I think it, it, I mean, yes, I'm, 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 I think I hope that it works as a novel, but um, obviously mm. it is made up of these different things, which gave me a great freedom as a writer. Um, but uh, the, the idea of it was a novel. I, I thought mm. at first it might have to be a campus novel because anything I'd read before, that had philosophical ideas in it was off like David Lodge's novel, Think, um, and there's a couple of others, um, oh, one of which we, we could talk about later. But um, mm. the, the uh, idea that you, you have to explain things, you have to have maybe a, a, a lecturer or somebody who's the, who represents the mind who is going to be mm. there to explain the philosophical parts of it. Um, and then somebody else who's cr who's a creative person or a student who's going to listen to these ideas and process them. Um, and so I, I kind of started with that with Eliza and Rachel that they would um, they would represent those two different things. Um, but actually, that that was 
quite, I, I was liberated from that quite early that I, I didn't have to do that. You know, I wanted the stories to speak for themselves. And if you were interested in the thought experiments, great, but I was only going to do reference that in a small way so that the stories hopefully could stand on their own. And so in, I, I was going to ask then, yeah, about your, if there were specific influences for this, because it is so original what you do in it that I don't think it's restricted to any genre or category, you know, it sort of straddles a number of different books like that. So I wonder if, are, are there other books that you've seen which yeah, sort of break out of a kind of category like this to, to do this, that, that sort of inspired you to, to, that sort of showed you that, you know, you could really do whatever you wanted in it? Mm. Um, well, uh, I think the Bourguet's, um short stories, he, he always um, has their, their sort of thought experiments in, in their own right, I think. I don't know that many of them reference particular thought experiments, but they really develop the genre into um, these sort of magic realism um, ways and sometimes some very succinct, sometimes quite dry, but very ideas driven um, about uh, libraries and what different worlds and um, and the, the role of the author and who does the work exist before the author exists and all those kind of ideas. Um, so I, I, I was inspired by, by him very much. Um, in terms of the actual formula of the book or the, the way it's um, structured, I, I hadn't seen anything quite like that, but I was very um, encouraged by um, a visit from the Goon Squad where their ideas are sort of threaded through and you go back and visit other characters and obviously um, the uh, Elizabeth Strout novels, the Olive mm. Kitteridge um, books, um, where sometimes she's hardly in it at all. Or So mm -hmm. those, those, uh, those in recent, obviously there's hundreds of years of people doing that with short stories, but um, those were the more recent ones that I thought, oh, right, yes, no, I, I can do that. And it's amazing how how liberated you can be when you suddenly see something and think oh right i don't it doesn't have to be this i can do i can do this completely different thing mm -hmm, absolutely and what was the process like of um of placing the novel with the publisher because i think most novels you know there's a a pitch or a hook to get publishers interested um, and you know using as few words as possible and I don't think you can sum up this novel by just saying it's it's like Bridget Jones meets Rene Descartes um, which <laughs> I definitely don't think that's what this novel is. <laughs> I like um, that but... we might use that Eric. <laughs> <laughs> and like and I don't want to speak like in crass marketing terms but did you or your agent find it challenging to sort of sell as it were the the concept of the novel to publishers. Yeah, I mean, it was it's hard. It was hard for me to to explain it. I never got my elevator pitch um, down. Still, <laughs> still working on that. Um, and uh, yes, it, it was it was hard. I think quite a lot of people read it, and you know that it, it didn't fit into something where they could say. Uh, quite rightly, it's a big risk to take um, publishing a book. So I do understand that it's hard if it doesn't. Um, conform to anything that's that's already out there, um, not because um, publishers or, or the publishing industry is crass and unnuanced, but mm. just because they've actually got to to sell it somehow. Yeah, and it's, it's a business. To, it is a business, <laughs> and um, if something is uh, is got a different take, then I, it's it's hard. It's a hard that is a harder sell. So yes, lots of rejections. Um, Lots of, uh, we like it, but we don't know what we do with it. Mm. Um, but then, uh, yeah, but my agent was very patient. <laughs> for, for people who haven't read the novel, um, as you already explained, like each chapter um, or story in the book begins with a, a different thought experiment. Um, so, so when did you first happen upon thought experiments? Was it in your philosophy degree or had you read them before? And was there a particular writer or a particular thought experiment that sort of seized your imagination? Mm. Thinking like, Well, I think we all know some thought experiments, even if we don't know we know them. Like mm -hmm. um, people often talk about Schrodinger's cat, for instance, mm -hmm. which is about whether the cat in the box is alive or dead. And at some point in what they call quantum world, it's it, it could be both. There's a possibility that it's both. So I think 
once I started to, to, to study them a bit, there were loads that jumped out at me. And, uh, and I, and my favorite ones, it's like my hit, it's like my hit list on in there, in the, in the book. <laughs> um, but, and I was also really keen on the idea that I think a lot of people find the, just even the word philosophy off putting and think that it's not for them and that um, they won't understand it. And, you know, I, I, there's, I, I'm not no great philosopher. There's loads. I, I've only studied really these very narrow things. Um, so when people throw the, their amazing philosophical knowledge at me, that they know more, much more about it than I do. Um, but uh, I, I'd lived with these these um, little stories for a long time, and uh, I just loved the idea of expanding them. Um, and I wanted people to be able to find them accessible and not feel like that's not something for them. And did the inspiration for each story or section of the book, did that come from the thought experiment or did you have sort of the story in mind first and then because of whatever conflict or ambiguity within that part of the story, you found a thought experiment that sort of fit with that? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, well, I had a sort of, list of the thought experiments is that I was having to do um, you know when you're doing a creative writing degree you, at the same time you also have your research side so mm. uh, and that's why I wanted to do that project at university because this, you don't have to obviously write a novel at university you can just do it but um, it was having that sort of structure where I could do the research and and they fit together really well because I was constantly looking around the subject or in philosophy of mind, which is this idea of, of, of what the mind is. And I was quite angry because everything in philosophy of mind these days is about how we are just what we call electric meat. We're, we're, we're almost a computer. We're, we're an organic computer uh, with emotions, but the idea that we are unique and have a separate consciousness or identity is just a, a fallacy that's produced to help us exist. I don't feel that, but I, then I, I also think if that is true, and, and it may be um, that we are entirely quantifiable, it doesn't matter because we still don't think that we are. And that's the important thing is how we feel um, and what our connections are with each other. That's the important, interesting thing about us. So um, I thought it doesn't, doesn't really matter whether whether in the end you'll be able to, to build something um, and make us out of uh, just materials um, because it's what we do with that that's interesting. Um, so that's what I wanted to explore and, and to go back to your question, when I was looking, when I had the stories and then I was building my own world of who the characters were, um, it, it actually came quite, they fit quite easily. I found that the I had these certain ideas of what I wanted to look at and I had a cast of characters and I let myself choose the character um, and also the time period, as you, as you know, it goes backwards and forwards in time and also sort of around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, th I, I was, so I, I really had complete freedom to, to do the story that I felt fitted with the right experiment. And that then at that point also, I didn't know if I would even include the experiments in the final book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I decided to just do a little introduction. I don't know about you, but sometimes quotes in books are really interesting and I find them engaging. And then other times I don't, I hardly look at them and it doesn't make any difference to my appreciation of the book. Mm. And that's what I felt people would either be interested in that part of it or not. And they could just turn the page and hopefully that, you know, it's no different. It's either something that appeals to you or it doesn't. Well, yeah, I think it does work in that way. Like it's an, it's a sort of extra nugget almost of, of sort of information or way of thinking about the story. So you might read it and then sort of forget about it as you're reading the story. But then after you finish each chapter, then you can go back and then read that thought experiment and then maybe think more about, yeah, how exactly. that exactly. interacts with that yeah, particular concept and thought experiment, so, which is so yeah. interesting and, and lots of fun as a reader, because I mean, I love rereading things. And I, so I think, you know, that it, um, it will really lend for a rereading because then you'll see more. Yeah, and I, and I love puzzles. Mm. Um, and I, and so I, the idea of something that's a little bit of a puzzle uh, that you can 
engage with however much you want to and also maybe you're coming to education later in life and um mm. Mm. Uh, you know really i only finished going to school at christmas <laughs> <laughs> And I'm a grandmother, so <laughs> um, I I I think I, I like the idea of of if I want if I felt like it of of learning something when I'm reading as well, you know, mm. or not having to, but if you want to, mm, that is yeah. fair. Um, and I'd also like to talk about ants because ants um, play yeah. quite a big yes. part in the the story. And the very first story begins um, with this very creepy image of Rachel waking up believing an ant has crawled into her eye and um, and the, the inside cover actually reminded me sort of almost of uh, like Salvador Dali and art yes. and and, um, and there is a kind of surrealism or dreamlike quality to a lot of your writing so I was wondering were you influenced by surrealism or what, what inspired you to write about ants and did you mm. did you have this nightmare as well yourself <laughs> well I have a I, I, I think we all probably have quite a strange relationship with insects um, you know they're very much there in our life and mm. uh, and we have to engage with them I mean I've got moths in my flat and I used to have this wasp that used to come into my bedroom every night however many times I killed it um, yeah uh, and then the ants um, so obviously uh, th there is long history of ants being used in, in literature as a, um, a metaphor uh, or an analogy for human beings. Um, they're also almost like the, the sort of building blocks of the smallest thing we can see that's like a building block of life where you can sit and watch it and they've got a whole um, ecosystem involved in there and you can, you can observe it. It's almost like their atoms, I think, in our brains, that's how I, I think of it. Um, but also, I actually had ants living inside my computer, um, and sometimes they would crawl up out of my keyboard. And I tried telling my son this one day, and he thought I was being funny about having a bug or something. Um, you know, that I, and, and, and then one day, then he saw, he said, There's an ant coming out of your keyboard, mom. And I said, I know. <laughs> They, they live in, they, they live in there and i just thought that it's perfect you know they um, the complete synthesis of my work and the yeah. ants yeah and then i wanted to look at the idea of in a relationship this idea of trust and bonding with somebody and believing how they see the world because i think that's such a big um stress in a relationship of you know, you get, when you first get together, you sort of idealize each other. And then after not very long, you start to realize they're flawed too, obviously, as well as you. And then it's a question of whether or not you can go along with those flaws and can they go along with yours and how much of your world is going to be united. And for me, it was a really big thing in, in my life with my partner. And so I, I, I wanted something that would test that for them. Would they would, would Eliza, the scientific one, be able to believe in Rachel's idea of this ant in her eye? And speaking of the, the relationships, I found it very moving how your story portrays some of the challenges that same-sex couples encounter when they decide they want to have children, um, but you, you don't do so in an overt political way. Um, but, and I can't think of many novels that actually explore this subject so were you drawn to writing about this because you feel there's a lack of representation of this in fiction or did it just naturally arise um, when you started writing about mm. these characters um it, it's very much in my, in my life a lot of my friends um have been going through this and and uh so a lot of the couples that we know and single people have mm -hmm. um have explored different ways of making families and um, and having been through uh, a big change in my life when um, you know I was I was married to my children's father and I fell in love with Renee um, and I saw this huge transition and how things have changed so much in politically in Britain um, in the last twenty five years since since Renee and I have been together. I, I, I did want to to tell that story in quite a straightforward way. Like you say, it's not meant to be overtly political, but um, it is definitely 
uh, a reality for for a lot of people and also has been very difficult um less so now at the moment i don't that's that's all we can say really at the moment in mm -hmm. this country mm -hmm. um and uh so yes i want i wanted to tell to tell that story and and how um you know it's it's just it's just us um and i'm sure some readers will be curious um especially because this is your debut novel are there elements of the characters or stories which are autobiographical in your way um <laughs> I think you always dig into ants in your your, you always dig into yourself, don't you? Uh, I think <laughs> you don't even when you're not meaning to. You, it's there. Um, uh, so yes, I, I'm. I'm. I, I would say uh, there is some things. Some some things there that are autobiographical. I wouldn't equate my relationship with Renee, my wife, as mm -hmm. the same as Rachel and Eliza's. But um, there are definitely comparisons to be made. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. <laughs> and I don't want to give any spoilers away for people who haven't read it, um, because it is so fascinating and wonderfully surprising where your novel goes. Um, but it does move into a future point later in the novel. So did you always plan for it to go into the future? Or did the idea for this just come amidst the, the writing process? And you thought, oh, I'll just continue it on there. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I took that sort of so, so so the different stories are sort of different genres in themselves already mm. and i took that from the style of the original thought experiment um so so some of them are very down to earth and some of them are more surreal uh, and i tried to reflect that in the style of the story um and then these these other thought experiments are very much uh so there's there's one about zombies philosophical zombies are a big thing in philosophy um and there's one about um this twin earth idea where you go to another planet um and things seem exactly the same but they're not um and that's exploring the ideas of meaning and things and then one day i was talking to somebody about the book as i was writing it and they said something about one of the characters and they really hoped that they'd come back I won't say any more than that and um and i thought well yeah well i will make that idea come true but not quite in the way they envisaged mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and i thought and that's and that was when you know you you're it's those things like when you when you're doing a crossword puzzle and you can't solve it and you go to sleep and then you wake up in the morning and the answer's there that the writing this book was a lot like that all the putting the all the ideas in and letting them sit there until they met each other. And as we've already said, you um, you are an actor and have been for most of your life. So is the, the process of preparing for a role and getting inside a character's head similar in some ways to writing characters in fiction? Or is that process entirely different? No, I, I think it's very similar, actually. Uh, I spend my time when I'm writing I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very much in the space of the person. I, I sometimes am, do act things out, um, read things, say things aloud, think very much about what the person feels. But I went to a, the drama school I went to when I was a child was all about improvisation. So we spent, I spent about five years just imagining going into a room, imagining talking to somebody, imagine what that conversation might be what they're wearing, what you're wearing, what you can smell, what you can see, but actually all you're doing is standing in a room talking to a chair. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing. I mean, we all do that when we're little, don't we? Mm. One, one day I found myself in a rehearsal room for a play um, and I realized I was in the same rehearsal, the same space that I went to nursery school. And so 50 years later, <laughs> I was doing basically exactly the same thing that I was doing when I was three, which is uh, dressing up and running about. And um, it's, re it's really useful as a, as a writer because I, I'm very comfortable sitting there in my own world thinking mm -hmm. about those things. So I think there is a huge overlap, yeah. And I have to ask you another small question about your acting. Um, and this is very self-indulgent of me because um, <laughs> if I don't, my childhood self will never forgive me. But um, when, when the two movies you were in, uh, Return to Oz and Sherlock Holmes, were favorite films of mine when I was growing up. Oh. Uh, so I have to ask, what were your predominant memories of 
making those films and was it an enjoyable experience? Yeah, I mean, Return to Oz, um, I think they've done the documentary about it. It was quite a troubled film. And um, <laughs> I, I was uh, 18, I think. And um, mm, really there, there, there was a lot of special effects, as you know, in that film. Mm -hmm. And um, there, were also, there was also a lot of trouble making it. I don't think I'm revealing too much here. Um, people were being fired all the time. And I was just coming into the studio every day I didn't know anybody there. And there were people, you know, the, do you remember the wheelies? Those, <laughs> the, the, yeah, terrifying. Um, but they were always rehearsing because it's really hard to go, uh, to move around with the wheel on each, um, mm -hmm. at the end of each limb. And um, there was TikTok. Uh, that was a man who was folded in half with a camera between his legs and then sealed into the, and there were the oh. chickens and there was a guy on stilts. And, but they all had their very physical, things that they had to do and rehearse. There was nobody else uh, who was there. I was there for two months. <laughs> I only had a tiny part, as you know. Um, but, <laughs> but you look so there. fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, they made it look amazing. What amazing sets and costumes. But mm. we had to have leaning boards because of those big spikes that came out of our dresses. We couldn't sit or lie down. So right. we, had to, we had to have these rests that we would just tilt tilt along so it was quite a physical physical film strangely um but yeah it was great fun it was really amazing thing set to be on obviously and young sherlock holmes was uh, was was brilliant and with lovely nick rowe who who plays sherlock and um spielberg produced it and i'd met him briefly before we before we were filming and he's such a big hero of mine and i was so obviously very very happy to be working on a film that he'd made and, and in addition to acting um you've also been the narrator of many audiobooks um including your own now um, and and uh, and i've <laughs> yeah. always wondered what's the process of narrating an audiobook like um do you read the book first and then sort of decide how you want to perform it as it were or do you take multiple takes um which then an editor then sort of sifts through and what's the general sort of process of it so the you the usual way before coronavirus was that you'd go to a studio um and there'd be two rooms with a glass connection and you have a producer on one side you sit in front of the mic for three four five days it takes about a week to prepare it before you go in um, because of all the voices and you don't want to get to page 206 and realize that person has an Irish accent uh, <laughs> or, oh, that's the same person that was speaking on page 45. So you have to have all that. Highlighters come into it a lot um, and research for pronunciations and things. And sometimes talking to the author about what the maybe there's some something that they're trying to convey that you you need to, the spirit of that needs to be in the audiobook um and uh so there's that preparation and then you sit in the studio literally in your chair for 10 hours a day um and 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 record it uh obviously you make mistakes as you're going along and they edit some of that as you're going along and then they put it all together afterwards um but during coronavirus <laughs> I have a studio at home, which is basically a cupboard, covered in blankets <laughs> and all the equipment. Uh, and so I've taught myself to edit it, edit as I go along so that because they don't have the um, studio set up. So, um, yeah, it's been a whole new skill, but I'm, I'm often in my cupboard. <laughs> uh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and when, when your character of Rachel, she reads um, Rachel Cusk and she gets recommendations for other authors to read based on books that Cusk references, um, which is one of my favorite ways of getting new book recommendations as well. And of course, at the end of this book, um, there's references to all your sources and suggestions mm -hmm. for further reading. So like, it, I'm you know really enthused to go and read some more of these authors mm -hmm. and philosophers. And I don't know how you have the time, Eric. You read so much. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it's a labor of love. That's why. Mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and so like as, as readers, we're often asked like how we choose what to read next. And you're obviously someone who reads all the time as well. So I'm wondering, how do you choose what you want to read next? Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, obviously, word of mouth is great. It's not, it's, it's hard to give somebody a book, I think, as a gift. But it's great if you're having a conversation with somebody and they, 
and you, especially if they know you a bit and they say, oh, well, I, this is what I'm reading. Da, da, da. Obviously, I read all the book reviews, um, listen to all the book programs as well. So you know what, what strikes you as something that you... And, and then that great thing where you discover an author and they've got more than one book and you can read their whole back catalogue and or they've got another one. All of that is so, I, I love that. And the, yeah. some of the conversations. But I wanted, because I wanted to show you a book that really inspired me for this book. And I don't okay. know if you know it, The End of Mr. Y by Scarlett Thomas. No, I mean, I know of that author. Um, I've never read her, but um, I've always wanted to because, yeah, she sounds really intriguing. It's like somebody. Yeah. Like... yeah, she really is. And in it, there is um, a conversation that happens with um, a, a student who's just starting and uh, starting a PhD, I, I think. Or, uh, anyway, thinking about it. And this guy is uh, interested in, in literature and philosophy, and he's and she says, I love these thought experiments. They're so interesting. And he says, well, why don't you do your PhD about them? And she, she was like, yeah. And he says, just think about their thought experiments. And you do your, and write about that. And, um, and when I read, so I read this about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's not about that. It's about um, this other world that the characters go into that they access through Victorian literature, which is another favorite thing of mine is Victorian literature mm. um and uh but that one little conversation that's about six lines made me think oh, i could do that i could do that phd so i feel <laughs> like i made myself become a character in in her book <laughs> um and actually then lived it i probably didn't realize it was going to take eight years of my life <laughs> but um yeah that's so i mean how amazing that one can do that in life you can look you can read a book and go i want to be that character yeah it can completely yeah, change the direction <laughs> of your life then yeah that's that's yeah. amazing um and since uh yeah. since we are here on on video and and uh, and on youtube we like to show other books from our own like personal library mm -hmm. um are there other books that you have that uh you wanted to show that are sort of yeah. sentimental copies or like yeah or yeah well books? you gave me the heads up which is great so i've got a few um in front of me here sometimes i've lent them out and i noticed when i was looking for some today that i don't have all of the ones that i love but this this um which you probably know oh um yeah i can't remember if i've read that one or another rosamund lehman but yeah mm. um she she was very influential sadly this isn't the because uh, there was also um a lot of virago Copies. I was obsessed with Virago. Um, the, these Antonia White also. Obviously, that's how I first met Margaret Atwood as well. Um, and the Women's Press at the same time. They they both um, were doing uh, a similar thing, I guess, in the early eighties. And um, and I just would buy and every single copy that I possibly could afford of these of these or rent them from borrow them from the library so those are those are hugely influential it was I think those that's when I first stopped reading Victoriana which was all I'd read up till I was about 15 um just every trollop that I could get um and Dickens and all of those books that's that was my world until I was and uh, until I was a teenager anyway um and then there was, then I was obsessed with the Viragos. So those are, those are quite, those are very sentimental to me. Then more recently, um, I've been reading um, China Melville. Yeah, I've not, I've not read him either. Um, so yeah. he, the, this, this um, is so interesting about language um, and overlaps with something that I'm quite interested in and hopefully might do for my third book, I think. Um, and this is um, Murakami, yes. amazing. And again, very freeing as a, as a, as a writer one, mm. because he t takes you to all these um, places and then tells stories within stories and you realize, you know, that, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think I believe he's doing some amazing things with um, how to tell stories and, um, ways of, of of looking at uh, at the form which I, I i love and very very accessible and fascinating clever person um, and you you narrated 
you uh, yeah narrated one of her novels, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, well, well done. <laughs> <Didn't> <laughs> yeah, I? I'd forgotten that. Yeah, <laughs> actually, that, maybe I wonder if that was uh, what first got me back. I mean, obviously, I'd, I'd heard of her, but maybe made me re read a whole bunch of her books. Helen Dunmore as well, oh. who sadly died um, last year, was two it? years ago, maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah, last very year. recently. Yeah. Um, uh, and but won the Costa Prize posthumously for her for her poetry. And um, this is a fantastic book, talking talking to the dead. Um, mm. A little slice of uh, of life one one summer that happens to this family. Um, she's she's fantastic and one of those authors who just written successive great novels. You know. Mm -hmm over a long career of writing. Mm -hmm. So those, those are a few. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. It's just that I think we're always like very nosy wanting to see what other is on. Yeah, other I know, I'm so. trying to peer at your titles there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what's, what's on your current to be read pile or, or what are some good books that you've, uh, you've read recently that really struck um, you? Well, I've got the whole book a long list to read now. <laughs> a few that still haven't come out, I think. They come yeah, out there's four which are I think, coming yeah. out in the next month. Um, and, I, and I'm, just, they, they, all, they all look so amazing. So I'm definitely going to read all of those, obviously. Uh, also, I am judging the Royal Society Prize for the science book of the year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about 50 books. Um, so, yeah. That are keep busy. <laughs> no, I wanted to ask about that. Yeah, because I'd seen you were you were a judge on that. So yeah. that's all. Is that yeah. all nonfiction? Just science, purely about science. It is, but it's all very different kinds of science. Some of them are um, biography or autobiography. Um, some are the psychology. Um, there's ecology. Uh, there's hard maths. Um, pure maths and uh, there's um, you know archaeology and there's all different types of science it's not just um, biology obviously there's, there's it's not just one realm so it, it's very very interesting and the idea is that they are accessible to a lay person mm -hmm. so you can um, you should be able to pick up the book and understand the uh, the concepts that's great. Yeah, that'll be really interesting to. Yeah, mm, yeah I think it's a great idea for for a prize. I think it's fantastic. I, I'm not, I haven't historically read very much nonfiction. I'm obsessed with the imagination, so um, mm. it's good for me to read. So obviously, when I was doing my research for the PhD, I had to read a lot of nonfiction. But uh, it's nice. It's nice to be able to read things that are about so many different subjects that I know nothing about. And finally, I'd like to ask about your writing for the future. So you mentioned sort of possible third book. Does that mean you have a second book which is completed and that you're sort of shopping? I, around? I do. Um, it, I'm just finishing it at the moment, and I'm in that phase where I don't know whether it's okay or not. So. <laughs> I've got, there's a few people reading it, so we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll, <laughs> but hopefully that will be book two. Um, and then I've got an idea for book three, but I'm a very slow writer. Mm. I, I mean, I am just in such awe of people who can write a book a year or so. that is, I'm not, that's not me. <laughs> that's very um, rare that an author can do that. <laughs> I guess, yeah, yeah, but there, there seem to be there seem to be a few. Um, anyway, I'm not that person. I'm very, very slow, and I and I and I like sitting with it and exploring the ideas. And and then the brilliant thing is, as an actor, you don't get to go back and change anything because either it's filmed that day and that's that, or you only get a few weeks rehearsal off and on a play. Um, and you can change things a little bit from night to night. Obviously, you do because you're a human being and you're all fresh and hopefully reacting to each other. Mm. But uh, obviously, it's already rehearsed and everybody else is there. You're working together. So you can't change it that much. Whereas with, um, with a book, mm. once you're, when you're writing it and then you get to your third or fourth draft and you think, oh, wait a minute, that's so much better if I do that and I can or that person should have met that person and you can do it. <laughs> it's like, um, it's, a, it's a miracle really, uh, as somebody who 
spends most of the time in their head. That's that's great. I'm I'm looking forward to your future books as well. But um, but also yeah, big congratulations on this novel and um, which uh, which I should say as well. I'm um, very handily for anyone looking to start reading the the um, the Booker Prize list. Um, this is also out in paperback very very soon. Um, within the next week. I don't have a copy of the paperback, but it um it looks very different from uh, this novel. It's it's um. It's I've really got a beautiful. copy. Shall I? Oh yeah. yeah. Sort of. oh, I thought I did. Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. Very different. Very yeah. different. But, uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's uh, it's lovely, and I love. Yeah, that really captures the the spirit of of one of the the sections. So that's. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for for speaking with me. Um. For a while, sorry, this has gone on longer than I thought it would. But uh, but yes. Oh, it's such a pleasure, Eric, and I'm hoping that I will get to talk to you soon about your books that that you recommend and uh, and your choices. Absolutely. I mean, I watch your videos, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you. Well, uh, yeah, best of luck with the, the prize and, uh, and your future writing. But, uh, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk more in the future. And thanks, thanks so much thank for the you. chat. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.